Hey, um, I think we are live. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is Melanie Dizon. I'm the director of education and research at the Davis Finney Foundation, and I am here today with Wayne Gilbert, our uh, fabulous poet who has really inspired so many people in our community to use creativity and poetry um, to live better with Parkinson's. And today we are celebrating National Par or Parkinson's Awareness Day. And World Parkinson's Day. World Parkinson's Day. And we are doing this as part of Together Apart, uh, a, a, an initiative to try and share with people around the world a you know 24 hours of Parkinson's information, inspiration, stories, and I am thrilled that Wayne Gilbert has agreed to be our performer today. Wayne has been doing poetry for a really long time and he refers to it as metaphor medicine. So Wayne, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into uh, poetry? I will. I was uh, first diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2005 at almost 55 years old. Um, I started writing at 17, um, but I didn't get serious about my own poetry until uh, I was 50. Um, and I met a saxophonist um, who <clears throat> um, invited me to join him in a, um, in conversation after conversation after conversation between his saxophone and, and my words. And, and I kind of developed as a poet from there so that by the time I was diagnosed in 2005, um, the first thing I did was, was go to the page and, and start writing poetry um, and uh, haven't looked back since then. Well, we are all better for it. And we're so glad that you're that you're um, here to share this with us. So I'm going to give you the stage right now and uh, let you do your your work. Thank you, Mel. Appreciate it. Well, I want to start by expressing my appreciation to the Davis Finney Foundation, and and I want to express my appreciation by focusing really on kind of their motto, if you will, of living well with Parkinson's or living well as one can with Parkinson's. When I was first diagnosed, started my parky life, that is when the doctor first said, I believe you have Parkinson's and paused before she added, I'm sorry, referred, to, referred me to a neurologist in the system. I kept thinking there's been a mistake even though it perfectly explained so much of what was going wrong with me, I couldn't imagine it was factually accurate. Not as accurate as an eye exam. Not as dependable as an apple falling from its tree. This too shall pass, I thought, like a, like a virus or a bad dream. Of course, it didn't. This kind of cheap, gray, pseudo-spiritual pop culture dissociation was the first outer skin I had to peel away. Those easy memes we were taught in Sunday school, in elementary classrooms, in refrigerator magnets, on Facebook, at home, all the old, you'll get over it, ways we learn to ignore our own bodies, their needs, had to come off like bandages which had stayed too long, grown part of the scabs, the tender scars ripped off while Job's friends stood by with their self-righteous taunting. There was another layer to tear away. I didn't do anything to deserve these symptoms. I was not to blame. I, it had nothing to do with my behavior, my karma, certainly not original sin. It just happened. It's just what happens in a poorly designed universe which led to the next layer of resistance to scrape off. It didn't mean a damn thing. In any micro, macro, cosmic scheme, it didn't mean crap. It was just something that happened like windshield bugs. Of course, it happened to me. So leaving it meaningless 
was not an option. I wrote a poem. And I couldn't ignore the meanings I tentatively composed. I chose a poetry treatment program so my poems could help me, help me, help me. So it goes the rest of my life, I suppose, which is the last early onset layer to uh, shear away. I'll get better. I won't. Parkinson's is progressive degeneration. It gets harder every year. The big surprise has been how much better the poems have gotten. I'm not gonna to comment too much on the poems. I'm just gonna mostly share them with you and let you hear them the way that you hear them. For me, each is a kind of medicine every time, over and over again. This is a poem called, This is My Body for Brian and the Wounded Burned Saguaros in and around Tucson. They say my body remembers everything we ever experienced or imagined. My body has held me together since those first two cells united without my consent or intention, certainly without my awareness. Every movement, event, interaction, study, encounter, fantasy was marked, measured, stored, most of it, they say more than 99%, beyond consciousness, remembering of any kind outside atomic particles all fired up. My body's brain is especially adept at adapting to and integrating the infinitely complex dynamics of each moment, its neurochemical stew, weightless, invisible, churning, grumbling, rumbling, deep shockwaves, shakedowns, undetectable, misread, misdiagnosed, misapprehended, missed mysterious, except to my body, my body's own intercellular, subatomic, multiphasic awareness, cascading conversations, eroding constellations. Oh, stop it. I don't know any of this metaphorical jumble mix. My mind always chases itself into metaphysical freeway traffic. Back to my body, it's a body, mine, this body knows itself well. Every aspect of every existential split, splayed, micro sliced moment, my body sends messages directly to me. Imagine that, brief summaries from near infinite data, substrata, processed, reviewed, evaluated. Ow, that hurts. Mm, that feels good. That's uh, too much, Wayne. Stop. Keep working on that. That's promising. Trust me. That's true. Hey, that works, Wayne. Do it again. Unexplained certainties from my body's massive evolutionary library. My body hurts most of the time. What is my body remembering? that I can't recall? What news is my body reporting from its immense research development deep undercover? Well, my neurologist offers her diagnosis. My psychologist pushes me harder to reveal secret traumas embedded in my tissues, perhaps at the cellular level. My acupuncturist works to unblock my chi, which could lead to immortality if I'm not careful. My meditation instructor, teaches me to recognize, acknowledge my body's pain, watch it pass, floatsam on a wide river. My poetry books, jazz recordings invite me to feel my body's pain, express it freely for as long as it lasts. My spiritual advisor says, it's a body, forget about it. Physicists tell me the universe is vast beyond our calculation. 
Well, the whole shebang is a huge mess, especially my body, which will never stop offering itself up and organic degeneration inevitably progressing. Hello, 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 I know you can hear me, my body says, without me having to say yes, hello, yes, but saying it anyway. My body crosses its arms and squeezes me tightly, embraces our suffering. Another yes, yes, in the wound, like medicine for now. Like metaphor in medicine. Chronic pain has no language. Chronic pain has no language, destroys linguistic structures, philosophical analyses, systematic theologies, psychosocial niceties. Simple words cannot hold the tension required for letters to cohere Letters to become syllables linked neurochemically to other syllabic constituents make this one sound with some objective referent, subjective disclosure, negotiated accord, a word. Pain has no explanation, no justification. The sounds of pain are growls, oh, groans and moans, and cries and sighs, exhalations, less than words, unconscious metalinguistic vocalizations, oh, oh, oh. syntax-free post-grammatical significations, not quite meaningless, but, but pain is always new always now, always blameless, beyond comparison, fills all the empty spaces, sucks the air out of every room. Pain is always this pain. Pain is always my pain, uninterrupted. One of the things I love most about poetry is, for me at least, and I think for most poets, it's impossible to be dishonest. You have to say the way it is for you and then share the way it is for you. And you hope that others can hear the way it is for you and perhaps respond with the way it is for them. Sometimes poetry isn't enough, I admit it. There are other kinds of medicine, a therapy session, for instance, Eh, who needs them? I do, I have. So this poem is for Cindy and as always for Alice. So Cindy asked, what's missing? I was quiet a long time, finally answered, I, I really don't know. She said, it seems to me you've got all the pieces of a good life. They're not falling apart. I had to admit, she was right, except some pieces weren't working very well anymore, I said. Oh, she said. I see, she said. I waited for her to go on. She waited for me to go on. We smiled knowing what was going on. I said, I really don't know. Well, she suggested your symptoms are in transition now. That probably means more loss, more grief. <gasps> I gasped, a chill bled out of me. My body warmed. I remembered a folk tale in which a runaway servant removed a thorn from the paw of a lion. Yes, yes, I sighed. She added, and fear, I imagine, given your diagnosis, Symptomatic transitions must be frightening, even, I interrupted, terrifying. She nodded. I knew she knew. Her knowing made me smile. I said, every time. She said, yes, 
then asked, what gives you joy? I did not see that coming. Wow, I said, I have no idea. And we laughed together, <laughs> such an obvious lie. I said, not much. Listed my few pleasures, some of which had become more obligatory routine than fun, she asked, and hope? <laughs> I coughed contemptuously. I said, I don't believe in hope. Oh. She said, simply acknowledging my perfunctory faithlessness. I said, hope is a thing with daggers. She said, oh. I said, I never learned to hope. What's the point now this late in life? She looked into her hands. Several breaths came and went. Then I heard it too. I dance. I belong to a tribe of dancers called Reconnect. It's a dance for PD affiliate troupe here in the Denver metropolitan area of Colorado in the USA. And dance is not a metaphor here, people. Dance is not a metaphor. It can be a metaphor, but it's not. Sometimes I can't. I just can't. I, I hurt so bad I should stay home, soak in a hot salt bath, pity bath. Oh, that long drive. Oh, my crampy legs. 20 other reasons to skip dance this week. But I don't. I go. I change slowly into my dance pants, pull on my dance shoes shuffle into the studio where one by one my tribe hugs me, we spread out. I'm not ready. I can't do it. I'll start to cry. I will have to leave, but I don't. I move only a little at first until moving gets easier a little and I wake up Oh, I'm not pretty or graceful, but I dance anyway and forgive myself. Sometimes I get advice from other parkies. This is some good advice came from Shane all the way up in Toronto. We were together in the usual geographical sense, but we were chatting. You're missing something crucial, he said. The end game, the hard work, misery will be worth it. Perhaps a year from now, when you can see how much you've improved, he said, the uncertainty will have settled like mud. <sighs> will have settled like mud. That's a metaphor. Actually, it's a simile. Same difference. Mud to the bottom. He went on, if you aren't whole, well, you'll at least be less piecemeal, less handicapped. He pressed, let your hope mm, feed itself, grow roots. Let your hope generate neurons. Let your hope steep golden medicinal tea. He got real. You might not win the damn race, but you'll get out of that chair, man. Dance across the floor again. He added, remember to let your loved ones help you. He finished. Maybe you should create your own choreography, start a YouTube channel, regardless. Stay connected. Stay connected. Stay connected.
stay connected. Sometime last spring or summer, I can't remember for sure, I was introduced to the music of Sangeeta Michael Berardi. Sangeeta Michael Berardi is a jazz guitarist. And last summer he turned 81. I was introduced to him through a documentary called Playing with Parkinson's. He'd been a guitarist. His hands weren't much use on the guitar anymore, although he tried. And some of his musician friends gathered round him and brought him into a studio and they cut an album, the Mr. P sessions, I highly recommend it. They're available on Spotify and probably other places. But Sangeeta Michael Berardi inspired this poem. It's a Parkinson's jam. I'm telling you, man, Parkinson's sucks. You got to live with it, though, man. No, no matter how it breaks you down, live with it. Yeah, because, oh, yeah, that's the only way to get up after a night of mad, thrashing, night terrors, dystonic contractions, tremor, waves under the skin, anxiety, pacing in the belly, cage, nervous chatter, goading the amygdala. Man, that stuff is hard to take. Oh, yeah, even with carbidopa, levodopa, pharma jazz. Parkinson's is rough, brother. Maybe not as rough as ALS or God knows what other progressive degenerative neurological disorder might kick its ass suffering-wise. Parkinson's is a, is a bitch for sure. Often includes paralyzing fatigue, rigidity, sometimes dementia. I'm telling you, man, it's a damn disease can take you all the way down, take you out, make you wish you were already dead. But most of us figure it out by which I mean most of us figure out how to make a life, by which I mean make a life anyway, meaning regardless, despite. Symptomatic multiplicity, duplicity, which varies hour to hour, day to day. Our bodies are unreliable, our brains undependable. We must discover, invent, hammer out, instigate, work around. Work around. Man. We got to get back up. I'm telling you, we got to get back up. Parkies got to get good back up. Recruit, recruit folks who will help with our needs when we have trouble helping ourselves. Mm, when we have trouble helping ourselves, we need backup. LeBron James, his entourage got nothing on me, man. My team of care partners, all mine, except professionals, all of mine. Team, join me for free, out of love for me, not for money and fame, which I got none. Are you hearing this? We got to have backup, man. Parkinson's ain't pretty. It ain't sexy. It ain't graceful nor easy to watch. Nobody will ever see. No one will ever see me get over it. It hurts everyone I love, surges out in waves of pain, pounds everyone who loves me, hits hard without mercy. I'm telling you, man. Oh, yeah. Parkinson's cuts nobody slack. And you can't fight it. Oh, I mean, everybody wants to fight it. I, I can't. You can't take it on like battle, man. That, that warrior stuff only makes it worse, for me anyway. It's like those so-called Chinese finger traps, those little tubes we used to call handcuffs. And you put your fingers in both ends, and then the harder you pull, the tighter its grip. You can't war with it. You let it go. I'm not getting in the ring like some heavyweight knockout puncher. 
accept it for real. Man, honestly, Parkinson's is part of me. Part of me, I got to find some way to love, brother, because love is the only way. <laughs> yeah, you don't get me wrong. I'm no Dalai Lama, Saint, whoever, and watch you. I hate Parkinson's some days. It pisses me off. I want to wipe it out. I want to get it out of my body altogether. But I'm not that suicidal yet. You see what I mean? I take it in. Like an abandoned child, man. Provide care it needs. Care I need. So we can make some kind of life together. For better, always, for worse. <laughs> because that's what progressive means. It's part of the deal. I'm telling you, man, that's the hardest thing of all. That's the hardest thing of all, to care for myself the way I'd care for one of my beloveds. The care we need, me and Parkinson's, we together need. That's the hardest thing, man, to care for me. But when it works, it's totally worth it. Even now, hell, especially now, after all these years. The next piece I want to share with you is also a tribute to Sangeeta Michael Berardi on his 81st birthday. He got to hear that poem I just read to you, although he was locked in a nursing home. No one could visit, but his family would visit him outside his window. And through their cell phones, they could chat as much as he was able to chat because of Parkinson's having robbed his voice. And his son read that last poem to him and he apparently enjoyed it. And he was glad that the movie, the documentary that uh, was made had helped someone as he put it. So then I wrote this poem, because in the film, Sangeeta shares a story about one morning after a night of especially painful, agonizing about why me? I'll never be able to play again. I'll never be able to make music again. He poured some cereal in a bowl and poured some milk on it, and then he picked up the spoon, and he was trying to eat the cereal, but before he could eat, it dawned on him, it's music. He's making music. Hell of cereal, man. I'm, I'm making music. This poem is called Sticks and Spoons and Bells. Sangeeta. Oh. Sangeeta Bowls. Tremor beats, vibrant rhythm, sound rain, and aro dust. Sangeeta, the patterns, chaos, makes in the air, ripple and glide, bumpy clatter ride. (laughs) 
Sangeeta, sticks and spoons, sticks and spoons. Release spirit voices in the hard body. Sangeeta, every crucible waits. Every concavity. Wimmers, Sangeeta, to be Wrong. Again and again and again, Sangeeta, sticks and spoons and bowls. Tremor beats make music. Sangeeta, Sangeeta, Sangeeta. Brain to Wayne, brain to Wayne. Elect, elect, electric, space, dust, twinkling, double flake, tchka, Nero, bub, 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 star, bust, unlinked, linked, unlink. Linked, connected, 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 flash chemistry. Unleashed, release. Five, six, seven, eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Shuffle dub. Shuffle dub. Shuffle dub. Shuffle dub. Shuffle dub. Shuffle dub. All right. Shuffle dub. All right. Bring to Wayne. Rain to Wayne, rain to Wayne, rain to Wayne. Five, six, seven, eight, step. So there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a free jazz, hard rock and Nordic noise trio called Fire. <clears throat> and they have some songs out that um, I really love. This is called Parky Freeze Needs Fire. And it's inspired by a quote from Pima Chodron, the great uh, Buddhist teacher. The question always remains, in what do we take refuge? Do, 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 do,
brain dead zone static rigid old leather doom 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 short breath catch breath geared super low down ache drain ache fill ache drain ache fill breathe wheels groaning move move oh please Move, don't, 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 heavy ham hands, curling toes, lean brace, lean tip, totter, faceless only. My heart races, my mind fogs. I'm going to fall, I'm going to cry. Thick, wet glue, naughty, crib, strain. Wait, wait, listen for it. Wait. That's a hard bass line. Now explode with a sax whale. Some skins, pop, 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 hold it steady, man. Let them all ride on you. Read squeals, slide noise, scream growls. Throw down some solo sticks, man. Click, slam, bang, clack, boom, da, da, take it, take it back. Heart flow, full body, free weight. Buddha in, Buddha out. Whole breaths. Right step swing, left step swing, right step swing, left step swing. Take your body for a walk. Take your body for a walk. Don't, 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 don't. It's all jazz, ladies and gentlemen. It's all jazz. You want to play whatever you feel, feel whatever you feel, listen without thinking too much, let it flow the way water always flows toward free, no matter the pain, play that, no matter the suffering, play that, no matter despair, anxiety, depression, death, play that, all the ways you hurt, play that. All the little things bring you pleasure, joy, play that, feel it all, improvise, 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 above all, before all, during the entire set we call this life, listen, feel, go with that, play. There's only one night at this particular club called Earth, so play, freely play, put it all out there on the stand for all to hear, leave space for your bandmates too, because it's all best when the jam is cooking for everybody. It's all jazz. It's all jazz. I'm so glad to be here and share some of these poems and, and my own improvisational approaches to living well with Parkinson's. And I don't know if there have been any questions on the chat or, um, <clears throat> or not, but I can hang around a few more minutes and, and perhaps respond to some or um, any comments. All right. Mel? Yeah, so I'm going to ask you some 
comments because you probably can't see them. So um, some Gabby said, Wayne is so moving and inspiring as always. Lee mm -hmm. says, thank you, Wayne, for sharing your talent and your stories. Polly says, Wayne, this is a wonderful way to celebrate today. Thank you. Karen says, I'm so happy to see and hear your parka poetry. You speak for all of us. You share what is in my soul. Thank you. Connie says, making music. Thanks, Wayne. So good. Jinx Kelly. Hi, Wayne. So good to see you performing today. And Brian says, I got to listen to more Sangeeta. I, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to get the name, um, get his name so I could spell it and actually share it. Uh, great. So I, I have a couple of questions. I would love, um, I loved your poem on pain and you said, pain is always this pain. It is always my pain. I, I just thought that was so, so interesting the way that you, that you talked about it and the way you characterized it. So what, what does pain, how does it show up for you? And how does, how does this metaphor medicine help you with that? Well, um, uh, it shows up for me in so many ways, and, and they're often different, but um, from the very beginning in my legs, I've had the most trouble with, with my legs and, and dystonia and terrible cramping and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. But there's also the pain of, of loss and grief and, and the pain of changes in, your, in yourself, your body, your, your mental, your cognitive functioning, so many ways. Um, and... <clears throat> And I find that writing about them as honestly as I can helps me avoid the one thing for sure. Um, and that is to intensify the pain by, by paying too much attention to it without any sort of distraction or by, I, I learned that in a pain management course that, that um, one of the ways to help manage pain is to find ways to sort of not give it all this attention, not anticipate it because the anticipation sort of feeds it, makes it worse. So um, that, that helps. And then pain feels so meaningless when it isn't something you can fix. Um, so when I write poems, I find ways to make it somehow meaningful, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe not for anyone else, but for me it does. And I find that oftentimes people say, oh, you know, that really helps me understand my own pain a little better and relate to it. Because we there's this tendency to sort of divide ourselves against ourselves. You know, there's my Parkinson's over here and there's me over here. But the further that we make the distance between us, I, for me, in my experience, and, and I think for many others, it makes everything much worse, that kind of dissociation. So yeah. you know, just come closer and closer and closer without necessarily totally identifying with it, pain, for instance, but still like this is mine. Right. Actually, that, that the, the question that comes up a lot. I think I'm echoing. I'll fix it. Um, is that you? You are. You don't um, resonate with the fight metaphor about fighting Parkinson's, beating Parkinson's, and you expressed it so well today about that it's taking care of you means taking care of Parkinson's too. And I just thought that was such an interesting way of embracing it and saying, no, like the last thing I need is to fight this thing. It's not going away. It's never going away. It's always going to be with me. What is the very best thing I can do? Well, I can give it the most care possible. Yeah. Um, I love that. And, and I just won't allow my body to be a war zone. It's my body. It's me. I mean, it's happening with, to me. And, and, and as I expressed in the one poem too, it's, it's happening to my loved ones who have to experience this without really being able, from their point of view, to be able to do much, if anything, about it. So right. compassion and care, metaphors of compassion and care, are, I think, are much more helpful and in the long run richer in, in terms of us understanding and actually treating what it is that we're, that we're dealing with. Yeah. One of the other poems that, I, I mean, I loved them all, but a couple of <laughs> stood out for me was uh, your, when you were talking about dance and you kept saying, I can't, I can't go, I can't do this. I've got a 20,000 uh, you know, reasons why I can't go. And then you say, I can't do this. I have to leave, but I don't. And then at the end of the poem or toward the end of the poem, you say, I forgive myself. 
So can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what is, what is that forgiving yourself? For not being able to do what I used to be able to do, for not being able to do what I can imagine and, and sort of have this sense that I should be able to do. I have another poem about uh, one day in, in the space behind me during the pandemic, you, you can see I, I decided to try to improvise a dance by myself and I had I turned on some music and 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 I started to move and um, and I fell. And I had a hard time getting up, and it hurt. And I was so disappointed because I could imagine my body doing things, but I my body just wouldn't do it. And the distance between those two, between what I could imagine and what I could do, oh, it seemed painful, but. What I, what I realized was there was still this little boy in me that wanted to dance, damn it. <laughs> and, and that little boy in me was like, woo, he was just spinning and rolling and, and diving across the floor and doing all that kind of wonderful stuff. And, and there was something in that that was good medicine for me and allowed me to say, okay, um, I forgive myself. Um, it's too... It's very easy, and, I, and, and this doesn't happen once and for all. I hope one of, the things, one of the things I tried to include in my set of poems was that nothing we learn about Parkinson's, living with Parkinson's, ever lasts. We have to do it over and over and over again. So it isn't like, oh, I discovered this little boy. Good, now I'm good forever. Like, no, but now I, have that, I know that little boy is there and I can sometimes call on him to do something for me. Um, cause I'm an old grandpa now. So maybe that's my, you know, my little grandson boy who, who does this thing for his grandpa, you know, I, and just, I don't, I'm not saying it, I'm not answering your question as clearly as I wish. Forgiving yourself for, um, not being what you wish you could be, what you used to be, what you want to be, what you long to be, but here you are, this is who you are and how you are, um, and that kind of honesty and compassion for yourself leads to a, a kind of acceptance that is not, uh, that is real and helpful and is really about forgiving yourself. Yeah. So I think we have how many people? Whew, very, very. Uh, in our community, that is a real, right? There's this, they, they tend, they'll live in the past, right? And they'll say, I used to be able to do that and I can't. And maybe for some of them, it just takes them out. They just, they can't really participate because they're so stuck there. Uh, is this something for you that has, that you've grown over the course? I mean, you've had Parkinson's for a while. Is this something that was, you know, really challenging and now you're, have a better relationship with it? And what do you think uh, caused that? I mean, aside from your, metaphor is your wife over there saying yeah, I don't know what did you just say oh my god yes oh, Alice my says, wife oh, my says oh my god yes <laughs> yeah I, I I think you know I said we have to learn it over and over again or revise it over and over again but you get one gets better at practicing the, it's that's why the jazz metaphor works so well for me is you know you never you never become the master and you're finished um, there's always some, somebody throws something new at you and you have to, uh, and you need to like play back to that. Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock tells a story about how he was playing with Miles on, on stage one night. And I mean, he just hit the wrong chord entirely. And he was, <gasps> he was just like, oh my God, Miles is going to kill me. And Miles didn't flinch, didn't change his breath or anything, just took the tune that just took what they were playing and went in a whole different direction. And afterwards, Herbie said, my God, I'm so sorry, Miles. And Miles was like, Herbie, there's no wrong notes. There's each, it's, there are just new opportunities. Like, oh, okay. So you get better at sort of adjusting and improvising and, and playing. Not that it's ever easy. It's always, um, nothing's been this hard in all my life. Um, and it doesn't get easier, but you get better at 
practicing with practice, like meditation is the same way. Um, so many things that are good for you, you don't get there all at once forever and ever, amen. You have to like, keep coming back like, oh, but then you know what to do. You know, like, oh, I'm crying again. I'm so depressed. I don't want to do anything. Okay, what do I do in these situations? I guess I have something to, I have something to fall back on. Right. I also find that sometimes it's tiring in people. Uh, the, the Miles Davis reaction, right? The, the reaction of, no, 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 we're, this is just, we're doing this. Like, we're doing this now uh, because this is the way that we were directed to go, right? Instead of, but we were supposed to do this, right? Right. Um, that's, yeah. that's a, a free. Choice. And what could even say there's something to be said for like throwing, throwing uh, disruption into the routine every once in a while, especially if you're sort of open to something positive. Uh, um, in the uh, in the ambassador poetry group that uh, that I'm part of that meets each month, a, a poet recently wrote about routine and how you know during his routine there would be these little disruptions, but each one each disruption was something like helping someone. Um, so he was kind of attuned to those. The other otherwise he was like locked into his routine. So there's something to be said. I mean, the fact is we don't learn as human beings unless we we push a little bit beyond our comfort zones, as they say. Um, but it's always hard. It, it's always hard. Right. Um, I want to ask a question from, from Amy uh, Carlson. Wayne, do you feel like your creativity has been affected by Parkinson's? <laughs> wow. Oh, of course. I mean, everything's affected by Parkinson's. It's just everything. There is nothing in my life that is not affected by Parkinson's. And every time I think there is something, um, I get a nice surprise. Or a not, uh, Yeah, um, of course. Um, and, uh, but I'm not saying had, had, had Parkinson's not happened, I wouldn't have found other ways to sort of be creative. Um, but yeah, I, I know lots of people become more creative in, in part because of medication. That was not, that's not the case for me. Um, but I, it's just so, Parkinson's is just so hard that anything that helps make it meaningful and bearable um, and, and to help you find the spaces for um, appreciation even for joy, um, or to even make something of the blues, you know? Um, music is so good at this. We never say to people, like, you should only write happy songs. No, we love sad songs too. Um, we love great ballads that are, you know, um, as well. So the, the full range um, and so creativity keeps that range of possibilities like open. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what I would do without my, uh, I, have a little, I have a journal I write in every day, micrographia or no. Um, and, and all my poems start there. Um, and it's a daily practice. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. And possibility. I would love to hear about your book. Can you hear that with us? <laughs> I'll just happen to have one here. Yes. These are all poems. This is a this book just recently came out, and it's it's only available from me. Um, I, it's not self-published, but um, you can only get it from me. And these are all poems I wrote during the, since the pandemic began, they're, they're pandemic Parkinson's poems, sort of, um, perhaps not as strongly as the poems I've, I've shared today. Um, and each poem was prompted by a quote from Pima Chodron uh, in the book, um, When Things Fall Apart. Uh, my wife, Alice, and I read that book together again when the pandemic first started. And then afterwards, I went back through and looked at all the underlining parts and reviewed them and, and pulled out certain quotes. And then I would use that as a poem starter. And, and, uh, and then I, I found a publisher or a publisher found me um, to, to publish them in this 
um, really nice little book. I'm very, very proud of it. Thank you for asking. So where, where can people get it? Um, it's, it's called Sacred Chill. Um, and gosh, I should have the address and know it on top of my head, huh? Uh, you can email me or contact me on Facebook. Um, on Facebook, I'm Wayne A. Gilbert. Okay. My, my email um, address is magmapoet at comcast.net. Magmapoet is one word, magma, like what's under volcanoes. Magmapoet at comcast.net. And uh, I can send you the link to order um, one of the books. Okay, great. Well, actually, we'll put it in the show notes and um, when we share the video as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wayne, so much for doing this today. We always love hearing your poetry, and I can't wait to share this with everybody uh, who wasn't able to make it today. Thank you for Together Apart for putting this uh, day-long celebration of World Parkinson's Day together. And uh, we really look forward to more opportunities to share some of the great work that you're doing, Wayne. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to all. And hello, greetings to all the Parkinson's community across the globe. And thank you, Melanie and Davis Finney Foundation for this opportunity. Um, I'm just thrilled. Thank you. We are too. Thank you, Wayne.